Welcome, everyone. Thank you for joining us for the fifth COVID-19 webinar hosted by the Chinese Antibody Society. I'm Kong Yao, a member of the Executive Committee of the Chinese Antibody Society. Today, we're delighted to have Dr. Jens Reichert from the Antibody Society presenting on new and repurposed antibody-based drugs for COVID-19. As introduction, the Chinese Antibody Society is a nonprofit professional organization focusing on therapeutic antibodies and relevant therapeutic modalities. Our mission is to build a platform that facilitates the collaboration of the global community working in the antibody field. We also run the peer-reviewed journal, Antibody Therapeutics. The COVID-19 webinar series aims to help address the thorny issues surrounding this pandemic with our expertise. In this effort, we are collaborating with the Antibody Society on several fronts, including a well-maintained tracker of antibody therapeutics for COVID-19. Our speaker, Janice, today will also touch upon the tracker. Before we start, we'd like to thank our sponsor, Acro Biosystems, who has a brief mass message for our audience. Acro Biosystems is a leading manufacturer of recombinant proteins and other critical reagents to support the development of target therapeutics. To facilitate research on SARS-CoV-2 and help fighting against the COVID-19 pandemic, Acro Biosystems has developed more than 60 SARS-CoV-2 related products, within which about two thirds are recombinant SARS-CoV-2 antigens with multiple tags and species, mostly expressed by HEK293, covering all the critical reagents of SARS-CoV-2. It is worth mentioning that Acro Systems has developed a series of anti-SARS-CoV-2 antibodies, including our unique human-derived neutralizing antibodies that can be used as a control to develop various assays, and the matched antibody pairs can provide benefits for COVID-19 diagnostic test development. In addition, Acrobiosystems has launched antibody titer assay kits and neutralizing antibody screening kits for vaccine assessment and drug development. We believe our SARS-CoV-2 related products can greatly save researchers time and make the research on SARS-CoV-2 easier. Our speaker today, Dr. Janice Reichert, is an internationally recognized expert in the development of antibody therapeutics. Dr. Reichert holds many distinguished titles, including Executive Director of the Antibody Society, a nonprofit association representing individuals and organizations that engage in antibody related research or development, Founder and Editor in Chief of MAP, a peer reviewed PubMed indexed biomedical journal, a Managing Director of Reichert Biotechnology Consulting, a pharmaceutical business intelligence research firm. Dr. Reichert writes frequently on development trends for antibody therapeutics, including the annual Antibodies to Watch, published on MAP, a must read for anyone working in the field. Recently, Dr. Reichert has written a coronavirus in the crosshair series of articles published on the Antibody Society website. Today, Dr. Reichert will share her insights on new and repurposed antibody-based drugs for COVID-19. During the presentation, please feel free to submit questions in the WeChat group or using the chat feature in the webinar application. After the presentation, the recordings and slides will be available to the members of Chinese Antibody Society or upon request. We will also share the slides in the WeChat group. Now, without further ado, we will turn the time over to Dr. Reichert. Thank you very much for that kind introduction, as well as the invitation to participate in this webinar. Thanks to everyone for joining us today to discuss new and repurposed antibody-based drugs for COVID-19. I'll start off the presentation by explaining what we can achieve by tracking COVID-19 interventions. I'll then tell you about the process and some of the challenges associated with tracking these interventions. The data will be illustrated in my overview of the programs and molecules in development. There are very clear distinctions between the molecules that are intended as treatments for COVID-19 symptoms and those that 
are designed to target the virus itself, SARS-CoV-2. So I'll discuss these two groups of molecules separately. We'll then have time for questions. I've been tracking trends in the development of antibody therapeutics for nearly 20 years, but COVID-19 is certainly something that's quite unique in my experience, and I'm sure it's unique in yours too. The pandemic has prompted overwhelming response by the pharmaceutical industry and related service organizations. Collecting data on the response allows third-party observers, such as the Antibody Society and the Chinese Antibody Society, to determine trends relating to a number of factors, such as the level of participation, who is getting involved, companies that have experience developing antibodies for infectious disease, and those with substantial resources would certainly be the most likely to participate, but who else is getting involved here? Another aspect are the partnering networks. All organizations have partnerships of some type, but these have become essential during the pandemic, especially for organizations that require contract manufacturing. Who is doing what with whom? And how well are the projects going? Are there regional differences in partnering? How have the service organizations responded to the situation? These are questions that can be answered by examining partnering networks. A very critical factor in the pandemic is, of course, speed. The speed of discovery of these molecules, their preclinical development, the clinical studies, as well as regulatory review. It certainly appears so far that every phase has been remarkably accelerated compared to conventional therapeutics development. But how long can this continue? Will fatigue set in? The quantity of interventions is clearly of interest. We're currently tracking about 150 programs or molecules. Is this all there is? I think it's rather unlikely because many large companies really don't report what they're doing. It's not material to their business and they are not required to say what they're doing. But if we don't have them all, how many do we have? Is it 50%? Is, it, is there going to be twice the number of studies if we continue to work away at collecting data over the next couple of years? Because certainly for the ones that enter clinical studies, information will be put into the public domain. So we have our jobs cut out for us in collecting data for a while. The quant quality of the interventions is clearly extremely important. How many of these molecules will prove to be safe and effective in human beings with COVID-19? And that direct, directly relates to the success rates of the companies that said they were working on anti-SARS-CoV-2 antibodies, how many actually started clinical studies. The pandemic is offering a truly unique opportunity to calculate a preclinical to clinical transition rate. Finally, there may be substantial implications for the process of drug research and development and regulatory affairs in the future. If the process has been accelerated so much for COVID-19, why can't we continue at the same pace when continuing developing drugs for other diseases in the future. Data we collect now may help to answer these questions and others in the future. Working with the Chinese Antibody Society, the Antibody Society is currently tracking, as I mentioned, about 150 targeted protein COVID-19 interventions. Most are antibody-based drugs designed to prevent or treat COVID-19. As COVID-19 developed into a pandemic, information about 
therapy and preclinical programs was released through both traditional channels, such as press releases, but also through non-traditional channels, such as LinkedIn, WeChat. Also, a lot came out, of course, on pre-print servers. However, as we collected up this data, it was fairly clear that the details were somewhat limited in many cases. The de descriptions could be vague or inconsistent. The specifics on licensing and partnership arrangements weren't always clear. Who was doing what, with whom, and which molecules were involved. All of this wasn't always completely obvious, but we captured the data that was made available at the time and sorted through all of it, and we will continue to update records into the future in an effort to capture all the information necessary to address the questions that I was just posing. We don't believe we've captured everything that's out there, that is the entire universe of antibody-based drugs, because as I mentioned, especially the large companies, they don't publicly disclose their information right away, but if the molecules do go into clinical studies, that information will pop up somewhere and we will capture it then. It's all a matter of patience. Another challenge, of course, is the substantial number of clinical studies that enroll COVID-19 patients. When I started collecting data in mid-March, and this was for the coronavirus and the crosshairs or post series, so the first post in that series, was, I think it was March 20th or 21st, and I had been looking on clinicaltrials.gov and I made a note and, and remarked in that post that there were about 115 studies at that time related to COVID-19. Well, just recently I looked again and that number has really dramatically increased to over 2,000 500 studies related to COVID-19. It's really remarkable and a lot of information that we go through, in fact, on a daily basis, looking for new information that's related to molecules of interest. So the tracker project itself grew out of this post series that I mentioned that I started in March called Coronavirus in the Crosshairs. It's nine parts so far. It examines the ongoing discovery and development of COVID-19 interventions, including small molecules, as well as the biologic drugs and vaccines. There's also a post on the diagnostics. Also on the website of antibodiesociety.org in the COVID section, there's a page that's the biologics tracker page that includes information about the clinical studies specifically of the anti sars 2 antibodies, as well as, of course, a link to the antibody therapeutics tracker, which resides on the Chinese Antibody Society's page. The next two slides provide views of the tracker, and this is here simply to illustrate the functions of the tracker, not to show specific data, so don't worry about reading the uh, specific text here. The tracker does include name, including the international non-proprietary name if it has one, or code names associated with the, the molecules, the target, the molecular format, the development status, so that would be discovery, preclinical, phase one, two, three, whatever it is, the developers as well as partners, and the primary country associated with that molecule pro program, as well as links to additional information. Importantly, the tracker has a search function. So you can just put in a keyword and it will pop up the records that are associated with that keyword. Also importantly, the data can be exported for you to play around with yourself. As shown here, the tracker data is also illustrated in graphs that are updated as the data itself are updated. And I do invite you to go and have a look at the tracker and take a stroll through the current data. 
at the outset of the project, it was really important to make some decisions regarding what to include and what to exclude. We could not do everything. There was just too much. So our focus is, well, of course, on antibodies because that's in the name of both of our organizations. The focus is really, though, on biotechnology-derived molecules because there are some other important molecules that we wanted to track, but they're not exactly antibodies. They're more targeted therapeutics. We did include, besides biotechnology-derived ones, uh, within that grouping, we did include molecules that came, the polyclonals that came from transgenic animals. We did not include, though, the additional plasma-based approaches or derivatives thereof. So we are not following all of the various and sundry efforts in the convalescent plasma area. So that is human hyperimmune globulin. We are not tracking hyperimmune globulin from other sources, such as horses, which is what Emergent Biosolutions is doing. We're also not tracking hyperimmune globulin that may be modified in some way, and that's an approach being taken by Clio Pharmaceuticals. They have something they're referring to as a COVID-19 hyperimmune globulin mimic. Essentially, they're using a little adapter that attaches to uh, hyperimmune globulin, not from convalescent patients, just hyperimmune globulin from healthy people. And their adapter, if you will, uh, allows that immune globulin to bind to SARS-CoV-2. That's the theory anyway. In addition, I should mention that programs sponsored solely by academic and government organizations are included in the tracker, but today I'm not going to include the, the analyses that, that include all of those. I'm today limiting myself to the commercially sponsored programs. So as of mid-July, the tracker includes about 150 records, as I mentioned, about 135 are commercially sponsored. So I'm leaving out maybe about 10% of the total. And that's because government and academic organizations do not market drugs. If these organizations, if the university or the government's organization has developed or has discovered an antibody that's of interest as a therapeutic, it will need to be licensed by the company, whereupon I would include it in the analyses that I put uh, into presentations such as this one, because my objective really is to track trends in the commercial development of these biologics. What I'll be talking about moving forward in the rest of the presentation are analyses on about 50 repurposed drugs and about 85 molecules that target SARS-CoV-2 itself. All right, so now I've given you lots of background so you can understand what's happened to date and what I'll be showing you as I move forward in the presentation. So by now, everyone should be very familiar with the key features of COVID-19. It's initiated by infection with the coronavirus, SARS-CoV-2. This virus targets the host protein, angiotensin-converting enzyme 2, and that targeting is done by the viral spike protein. Then the virus gets in the cells, it replicates, it leads to this disease, which is characterized by acute respiratory distress syndrome brought on by cytokines, that can lead to pneumonia. It can lead to tissue damage the resulting from hyperinflammation. And also abnormal clotting has been observed in COVID-19 patients. So possible biologic interventions include existing drugs that were already in development or even marketed for other purposes, but which were well suited to treating symptoms of COVID-19. 
relevant targets include interleukin-1, interleukin-6, interleukin-8, and GM-CSF. Novel anti-SARS-CoV-2 targeting molecules are clearly needed, and these can be antibodies or other proteins that bind to the virus. For example, the designed anchor and repeat proteins, also called DARPINs. So now I'll focus on just the repurposed antibodies that may be used to alleviate symptoms of the disease. Of the 50 repurposed antibodies that we're currently tracking, nearly 40% of those target only three groups of antigens. Nine target IL-6 or its receptor, six target GM-CSF or its receptor, and four target complement five, which may be described also as C5A or the receptor. The remaining molecules target a very wide variety of other antigens. They're listed here in alphabetical order, and there's for most of these, only one antibody that targets a particular antigen. In a few cases, there may be two. Many of these targets are associated with inflammation or some type of modulation of the immune system. Interferon gamma and a number of interleukins are represented. I will not take the time to go through the entire list now, but I invite you to go to the tracker for more details about the antibodies targeting these particular antigens. Most of the molecules that are for symptoms had been evaluated in at least one early stage clinical study when they were repurposed as possible COVID-19 interventions. In this graph, the green bars represent the most advanced phase of development for any indication, and the blue bars represent the most advanced phase specifically for COVID-19. 12 of the molecules had previously been approved for other indications, and recently two were already granted authorization for use in COVID-19, giving a total of 14 that are authorized. About three quarters of the repurposed antibodies are in either phase two or phase three studies. I should point out, however, that these studies proceed very quickly, and some of the phase two studies may be pivotal. That is to say, they may yield data that is sufficient for authorization, and phase three studies may not be necessary. In the next few slides, I'll discuss the two antibodies that are authorized already and some of the 16 in phase three studies. Biocad developed a human antibody targeting membrane bound and soluble forms of IL 6 receptor. It's now registered in Russia for patients with severe COVID 19. This molecule was originally developed for treatment of rheumatoid arthritis. Phase study in COVID-19 was initiated in late April. This study included just over 200 participants who received a, a single subcutaneous dose of the antibody in combination with standard therapy. According to BioCAD's press release, the results of the study demonstrated that the antibody would significantly reduce mortality among patients with COVID-19. As in the U.S. and other regions of the world, the Russian government instituted a fast-track mechanism for authorization of COVID-19 treatments, and the molecule was registered on June 5, 2020. The process and the organizations involved in all of this obviously worked at incredible speed to get through a phase three study and regulatory review in about six weeks. The second antibody authorized for COVID-19 is italizumab, which was recently, very recently, granted restricted emergency use in India for the treatment of cytokine release syndrome in COVID-19 patients with uh, this acute respiratory distress syndrome. The antibody is a humanized IgG1 target CD6, and it was previously approved in India for plaque psoriasis. 
on July 11th, Biocon announced that an emergency use authorization had been granted based on a study in four hospitals in India, enrolling a total of 30 hospitalized COVID-19 patients with uh, moderate to severe acute respiratory distress syndrome. syndrome. Only 20 of the patients actually received the italizumab. The other 10 received best supported care alone. Primary endpoint was mortality at one month, and based on the results of just this study, the uh, molecule italizumab was approved in COVID-19. Seven of the molecules being evaluated evaluated in phase three studies of COVID-19 patients are already approved for other indications. Tocilizumab in particular was an obvious choice as a drug for COVID-19 symptoms, as it's already approved for a type of severe or life-threatening cytokine release syndrome. It's included in over 55 clinical studies of COVID-19 patients, with three of these sponsored by Genentech Roche. Uh, the, these three studies are relatively large studies with primary completion dates between the end of July and the end of August. Positive results would possibly allow authorization as a COVID-19 therapy. I should also mention the published study has indicated that use of tocilizumab is associated with reduced risk of mechanical ventilation and death. Three other previously approved antibodies targeting IL-6 or its receptor are in phase three studies. Cerilumab targets IL-6 receptor and it is approved for rheumatoid arthritis. It's being evaluated in two phase three studies sponsored by Sinopi or Regeneron. Uh, one study is being conducted outside the US, has a primary com completion date in July. Now, Sanofi and Regeneron have already announced that uh, the study that's being done in the U.S. did not meet a primary and key secondary endpoints. And so the U.S.-based trial has been stopped, including a second cohort that was receiving a higher dose. So we will have to wait to see what done with this molecule, and in particular, the results of the study that's ongoing outside of the U.S. Two molecules being evaluated in COVID-19 target IL-6 rather than the receptor. Olokizumab was approved in May 2020 in Russia for rheumatoid arthritis. The, there's a phase two, three study that started in April that has a primary completion date in October and a second phase two, three study is not yet recruiting. So Tuximab is approved for multicentric Castleman's disease. Three COVID-19 studies, including this antibody, um, including a, one of these as a phase three study, but it's not sponsored by a commercial firm. The sponsoring company, though, has recently announced that they can proceed with a phase three clinical trial to evaluate sotuximab plus standard of care in hospitalized patients with COVID-19 associated acute respiratory distress syndrome. So we await the start of this clinical study. And again, my emphasis here on the distinction between studies that are or are not sponsored by commercial, commercial firms is the commercial firm that must present the results to the FDA to get the marketing approval. So therefore, I do have a bias and I do pay more attention to the studies that are sponsored by commercial firms. Nevertheless, the data from studies being sponsored by academic or government organizations certainly provide results that can be useful. An additional three antibodies approved for other indications are also being evaluated in late stage studies in COVID-19 patients. Relevant targets are interferon gamma, interleukin-1 beta, and C5. Emipalumab and anakimra are being evaluated with regard to their ability to reduce hyperinflammation as well as respiratory distress in patients with SARS-CoV-2 infection. 
This study has a primary completion date in July 2020, so we should hear something about that soon. The effects of canakinumab on cytokine release syndrome in patients with COVID-19 induced pneumonia are being evaluated in a phase three study. Primary completion date is in late July. So again, we hopefully will be hearing some results from that study soon. A phase three study of ravulizumab in patients with COVID-19 severe pneumonia, acute lung injury, or acute respiratory distress syndrome as a primary completion date in November. So that one will be a little bit longer before we hear anything. All right, so what happens if we get positive results from these studies? The organization uh, can apply to FDA for an emergency use authorization. The FDA can allow use of unapproved medical products or unapproved uses of approved medical products, which I've been talking about here for a few minutes. Um, that, so that use can be allowed to diagnose, treat, or prevent serious life-threatening diseases that certainly applies to COVID-19. And there are no adequate, approved, and available alternatives. So this happens because the Department of Health and Human Services declared a public health emergency. But that declaration actually expires at the end of July. It certainly seems likely that that will be renewed, though. It's important to note that there are limitations to the scope and duration of the authorizations, as well as specific conditions that apply to these emergency use authorizations and authorization for use during the pandemic, it's important to understand it is not the same as a standard marketing approval because of all of the limitations that apply to it. Sponsoring organizations may also pursue authorizations outside the US, as I expect, and that's certainly true, as we know, of Russia and India that governments in other countries have similar mechanisms for authorizations. So that concludes my coverage of the repurposed molecules. Now I'll move on to the stars of today's show, the SARS-CoV-2 targeted molecules. As I mentioned, we're tracking about 85 anti-SARS-CoV-2 biologics. Most of these, nearly 90%, are monoclonal antibodies. Most of them are full-length monospecific molecules, but some are nanobodies and some are alternative antibody formats, such as bispecifics. So we definitely have a few of those. And again, I would invite you to go to the tracker to see the specifics. About 13% are some other type of composition of matter, for example, the DARPIN, the, there are FC fusion proteins, there's an MRA that codes for an antibody. We also include the recombinant or transgenic animal-derived polyclonals. To the best of our knowledge, the SARS-CoV-2 spike protein is the target for all of these molecules and usually the epitope being targeted is within the receptor binding domain of the spike protein. This graph shows the most advanced phase of development for the molecules, not surprisingly, considering most organizations started projects within the last six months, most of the molecules and programs are in the discovery or preclinical stages of development. However, Five have advanced to phase one clinical studies. Three have gone a bit further and they've advanced to phase two studies. And one has gone as far as phase three studies. So I'll now tell you a bit more about those in clinical studies, starting with the monoclonal antibodies. Three monoclonals are at phase one with a study of Sorrento's COVID-guard molecule uh, pending. Uh, so it's on clinicaltrials.gov, but it's not yet started. And she announced this week that enrollment in their phase one study of JS016 was completed, uh, but the primary completion date is in December. So potentially we might hear top level results a bit sooner, 
or they might start a phase two study earlier than December. So that one may progress and we'll keep an eye on that one. The Absolera lily molecule was the first anti-SARS-CoV-2 antibody to enter clinical study, and that was in early June, or excuse me, late May even. Uh, the phase two study was started soon after. These studies have primary completion dates in August and September. To me, the most impressive amount of work so far has been done by Regeneron. Their product candidate is a mix of two antibodies, and it has progressed to phase three studies already, although the primary completion dates for the studies go from November 2020 to March 2021. To properly appreciate the difference between the Regeneron and Lilly programs, it's important to take a closer look at the details of the studies. The two phase one, two studies, which Regeneron is now referring to as phase one, two, three studies, they started first and they are evaluating the antibody mixture for the treatment of hospitalized or ambulatory patients with COVID-19. Both studies are large, over 1,800 and 1,000 patients who receive drug by IV administration. In contrast, the phase three study is evaluating the mixture's ability to prevent SARS-CoV-2 infection in household contexts of people infected with SARS-CoV-2. It's also a large study, including 2,000 people who received the drug via subcutaneous administration. So all these studies are evaluating efficacy. An important distinction then between Regeneron's effort where they developed two antibodies using two formulation uh, and they did it in about the same time that in comparison Lily and Absolera developed one antibody using one formulation. So not to take anything away from the efforts of Lily and Absolera, but Regeneron seems to have done about twice the amount of work. The Lilly Absolera antibody is in a small phase one study evaluating the drug in participants hospitalized for COVID-19. The phase two study is larger, involving about 400 participants with mild to moderate COVID-19 illness. In both cases, patients receive IV administration of the drug. Efficacy is not being evaluated in the phase one study but it is being evaluated in the phase two study. So based on the primary completion dates of these studies, we may hear top level results from the phase two study in mid to late September. I do want to mention a few of the other anti-SARS-CoV-2 proteins that are in clinical study. They're a little bit different compared to the standard monoclonal antibodies. The SAB185 is from transgenic cows. The clinical studies of that polyclonal mixture have not yet started. We expect those to start relatively soon. We are aware of ostrich-derived anti-SARS-CoV-2 antibodies so there's relatively little information about them. The information we have indicates that the nasal administration is being evaluated in a site in Japan. So we have included the, the molecule, uh, but we don't have a huge amount of information on it at the moment. XAV19 is swine glycohumanized polyclonal antibody. That is a phase two that is pending. Again, that study it uh, does not appear to have started already, but uh, it's another another effort that we're watching. And again, I invite you to go see the tracker to find the links that will take you to more information about these molecules. The one recombinant protein that, so this is not antibody-based, there's nothing about an antibody here. Uh, APN01, we're tracking it because it is essentially a control molecule. It's recombinant human ACE2. It would act as a trap for the virus, in theory. The part about the molecule that 
might be a little bit of a detriment is that it seems to have very short half-life. So there are another number of organizations that we're aware of that have efforts in making a fusion, an FC fusion of ACE2, which would be expected to have a longer half-life. But we are keeping an eye on this molecule and really are eagerly anticipating some results from the phase two study. Many other organizations have announced plans to transition anti-SARS-CoV-2 antibodies into the clinic by the end of the year. We are tracking all of these very closely. Details are included in the coronavirus in the crosshairs part nine, as well as in the tracker. The organizations that we want the tales from include the UMAB, uh, but their spin out now, Corat Therapeutics, as well as their partners, Celtrion, definitely eagerly awaiting Celtrion's uh, entry into clinical study with their molecule, Beer Biotechnology, AstraZeneca with their partner, particularly Vanderbilt University Medical Center. They, Vanderbilt has done a huge amount of work, a lot of antibodies coming out of the lab of James Crow. Uh, and in particular, another one of them has gone into the organization ID Biologics. So both AstraZeneca and ID Biologics ha are moving forward with molecules that came from Vanderbilt University Medical Center. Uh, Distributed Bio has done a lot of work in this area and is planning on putting something into the clinic by the end of the year, as is Verna Therapeutics spun out of or uh, partnered with the University of Toronto, Beringer Ingelheim has an effort. Uh, Adamab just announced they spun out the company called Adagio to specifically to develop a SARS anti antibody. Mimo Therapeutics also as well as Molecular Partners, as I mentioned, they're developing a derpin molecule that may enter clinical study or is expected to enter clinical study by the end of the year. So lots and lots and lots going on. A few other companies uh, may not have officially announced it, but there's a number of other companies that appear to be heading in the direction of having something that, that either they will put in the clinic or a partner will, and that includes Twist Bioscience, Pacifica, Fair Journey Biologics, having just partnered with Iontis, Immunoprecise Antibodies, Ligand, Aplexus, Fusion Antibodies. There's a many, many, many companies involved here, and we're keeping an eye on all of them. There are some early, so in early development, there are a number of different types of molecules. So these are non-canonical approaches. I just wanted to mention, and again, I emphasize you should go to the tracker for additional information. So a specific antibody that targets the virus as well as NKP46. So the idea of getting an NK cell, a natural killer cell in the vicinity of the virus. The, as I mentioned, there's an MRA, mRNA encoded anti-SARS-CoV-2 antibody that would be administered by inhalation. So that's different. Uh, molecular partners with their DARPIN molecule in particular that DARPIN has three distinct monomer proteins that can simultaneous, sim simultaneously target the virus in different key areas. Sorrento has a number of molecules that I've already mentioned, but they also have a, an ACE2 FC fusion protein uh, that is specifically called a COVID trap. And now to conclude, I just want to leave you with a few key messages. First off, I think it's pretty clear the pandemic will continue into 2021. Therefore, there will definitely be a global need for some time in the future for effective therapeutics and vaccines that need will not abate anytime soon. Emergency use authorizations are likely and hopefully relatively soon for some of the repurposed antibodies, including these emergency use authorizations for the anti-cytokines, in particular tocilizumab. There truly, truly has been an extraordinary response by so many organizations across the globe 
in developing anti-SARS CoV-2 antibodies and other types of targeted proteins. There are so many and the need is so great. I fully expect that a large number of these may get emergency use authorizations. It would not be, uh, be beyond the, the scope of what I can imagine that 15 or 20 antibodies or other targeted proteins could eventually get emergency use authorizations. So we shall see and we shall continue tracking and reporting. I'd like to conclude by thanking all of the dedicated volunteers from the Chinese Antibody Society. They've really been terrific. The ones who designed and executed the tracker were absolutely brilliant. And the help with the data collection and analysis has been very, very much appreciated. This has all been a tremendous amount of work and they have done a fabulous job. I'd also like to thank the Antibody Society's corporate sponsors for their support. Logos are arranged alphabetically. If you see your company's name and you're not registered as a society member, I would invite you to go to our website and register because it's free. We have over 30 sponsors, in particular Biocytogen, Distributed Bio, Fair Journey, Genmab, Janssen, Lava Therapeutics, Vitria, Charles River, these are all new this year, new sponsors this year. We've been very excited to have them join. We thank them and all of our sponsors for their support, especially during this very challenging period. So thank you to all of them. And finally, thank you to you for joining the webinar and listening uh, to my thoughts on the matter and learning about the tracker. With that, I am very happy to answer any questions that you might have. Thank you, Dr. Riker. That was a great, great talk. And so we will go ahead and take some time for questions now. And just a reminder, please feel free to enter any questions in our WeChat group or using the webinar application. And it looks like we do have a few questions. So let me start with um, this one. So John asked, so how to design and track a phase three clinical trial and how to deal with the potential ethical issues, if any? In a phase three clinical trial, it does depend on what you're trying to do in your patient population. So I have to point out a lot of factors involved, especially in the phase three, where you can be looking at, the, at patients who don't have the, the virus. So in that case, you are, we are looking for both molecules that can prevent the disease and infection with the virus and antiviral, so antivirus CoV-2 antibodies or targeted proteins of some sort that can treat the viral infection once you have it. So there's, there's two different scenarios there and you have different patient groups within each of them. So ethical concerns might be a bit different for those two groups and they might be different between the patients that are ambulatory so that is patients that are not as sick and compared to patients who are hospitalized compared to patients who are hospitalized as well as on ventilators so it's it's um it can be a little bit tricky to answer a question such as that just because of the large number of variables but i would say in terms of ethical concerns there's, there certainly are some ethical concerns in the, the vaccine area where they've actually been talking about and considering intentionally infecting people with SARS-CoV-2 to see what happens. Uh, you know, give them the vaccine first, give them a little bit time to generate antibodies, and then intentionally infect them. I think that's got some some ethical concerns there uh, in terms of 
phase three study of the treatments or prophylactic um, administration of an antibody. I think there, there are fewer concerns there. Thank you. Um, and John also asked uh, actually a few other questions. Maybe I'll uh, present them all together and you can uh, maybe address them in, in, in the proper uh, sequence. And another question that John had is there are reports um, reporting that uh, neutralizing antibodies would disappear after some time. So he's wondering, uh, so what should we do, like in maybe a uh, follow up uh, plan after that? And another speaker asked, is there any evidence showing that anti CoV 2 antibody has ADE? Both very good questions. So I'll start with the first one. I do think it is a challenge, again, in the vaccine space, where it seems like people who had COVID-19 do develop antibodies, but that they the titer drops off pretty quickly. Within a couple of months, there doesn't seem to be much in the bloodstream by way of neutralizing antibodies anymore. Do you think that is certainly a concern? It's maybe it's kind of to look at it, but it is kind of an opportunity for the folks developing anti SARS CoV 2 monoclonals and other targeted therapeutics because they can be used both in prophylactic and treatment settings and they don't just go away. I mean, they have a certain half life. Uh, and when that's, that's usually typically for a full length canonical standard antibody, it's approximately three weeks. So I don't see the issue of disappearing neutralizing antibodies to be really relevant with the monoclonal antibodies and, and other targeted therapeutics as long as it's demonstrated they're safe and effective. Because uh, you can just can keep continue dosing it. I mean, it's not a, a long term solution globally for everybody forever, because clearly we all need to get on with our lives. <laughs> but hopefully, in the short term, we would have enough of these that we could actually uh, help a lot of people in in both preventing, certainly with frontline workers. Uh, and in patients that would need neutralizing antibodies to use the monoclonal antibodies that are being developed for that. And then in time, once we could use other measures, including simple things like social distancing and, and use of masks to, to get the number of people getting infected to decrease. So on the, on the ADE side, I believe that still theoretical. I'm not aware. So that's antibody dependent enhancement of the infection. As far, and again, to the be, it's just to the best of my knowledge at this point, that has been brought up, but more in the case of the of vaccines and in generating antibodies that actually are non-neutralizing. Uh, within the recombinant space, within the monoclonal antibody space, I don't believe there's been any evidence to support the fact that ADE is a safety concern. It's something that people should be aware of and should definitely continue to think about that and, and ensure that it's not a problem. But no one, as far as I know, no one has seen that yet with the, with the monoclonal antibodies. Thank you. <clears throat> Excuse me. Thank you. So the next question is, um, so Rosie is wondering, so is the new antibody more antibody based drugs more promising or the repurposed um antibodies? And maybe let me expand that a little. Um if you if if you compare like antibody based therapeutics with vaccines and uh to see uh, anybody is just a more promising um solution to this pandemic 
Well, to me, it's not a matter of one or the other. There's, there's a couple things going here. First, we need them all. We need them all. We need lots of them. But there's sort of a timeline. And just practically speaking, the, the timeline is that, okay, this pandemic started and we basically had nothing. Uh, and so what's the thing that you could come up fastest? And that's convalescent plasma. So people are working on that, and that's all fine and good, but it has a lot of limitations, not the least of which you need the people that are generating the antibodies to show up and donate their plasma. There aren't enough people, and it's likely the titer of the antibodies is not high enough for long enough for that to be a viable option long term. Short term, yes, we should definitely be doing that. The next step, so if we get you know further into the pandemic, uh, and people have had time to start developing other things, then you know next up or or in parallel with the convalescent plasma are the repurposed molecules, and that's because they already exist, and but they can only help. They can only ameliorate symptoms. They're not really attacking the underlying problem. It'd be much better to attack the underlying problem, to nip the, the viral infection in the bud, if you will. So those aren't ready though yet. Well, again, it's, a, it's kind of a hierarchy and, and in terms of the, the time frames, first you have anything you can throw at it that's sitting around like remdesivir, then, then the convalescent plasma, then the repurposed antibodies. Now we're coming to where we might get some of these anti SARS CoV 2 antibodies within, say, the next six to eight months or so and get them available. But again, it's going to be a challenge because there's manufacturing of them. And as all that is going on, you've got the vaccine development. So this, these are kind of overlapping, but you can see the transition over time. You have to have all these things running because we need time to develop the new therapies, the new monoclonal antibodies, the new vaccines. And in the interim, you need these, these other activities going on, convalescent plasma, repurposed antibodies. But again, it's so early on and the need is so great that we need all of these efforts going quickly as possible in all of these areas. Thank you. Um, given the time, we'll just take one last question. And I think it's a maybe difficult one. So the question is, when do you estimate that a neutralizing antibody will be commercially available? Good question. <laughs> I am an optimist. I am an optimist. I, I, the front runner to me is very clearly Regeneron and they, so they are a powerhouse here. They have previous experience with antibodies, a mixture of antibodies for infectious disease with their experience with Ebola. They have manufacturing capacity. They have uh, tons of networks and I think they, of anybody, they are the furthest along and the most likely to get something to people fastest. When would that be? I would say it's the earliest, I mean, like the absolute earliest, and this would just be like small amounts of it that might be able to be given to frontline workers, you know, especially we need prophylaxis for the group, but also you know, kids for, for the patients. End of the year would seem to be highly, highly optimistic. But early, you know, Q1 2021 is, is possible, but it still doesn't mean that I'll be able to go to my local Walgreens and get an injection of it. I think it will be much, much longer before they're generally available. And that you're definitely talking into 2021. But just to get something with an emergency use authorization would be huge, it would be huge. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for the optimistic uh, 
as you mentioned, we, we, we do need that in this time. Um, so is there anything else you want to cover before we wrap up today? Just to wrap up then, I would definitely encourage everyone to go have a look at the tracker that's going on and uh, come back on a regular basis to both the Antibody Society site to see some analysis and commentary as well as to the Chinese Antibody site to look at the raw data coming out of the tracker. Again, very, very important that uh, we're being highly transparent with this information.